the 14th chapter of Romans. I confess I'm not quite sure how this is going to go because in some respects some of the things that this text touches on might fall into the category of things that we don't talk about when we're at church. I'm not sure it's quite to the level of being an elephant in the room, but I really pray that we'll let the word sink into our hearts and minds so that it's, it becomes a word for us individually and not for the fella sitting over in the next pew. Romans 14, let me read the first 13 verses. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us die to, dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. It's a scene that happens in more families than we would care to admit. But the father and the son had been arguing for quite some time. It didn't seem to matter what the occasion was. It didn't seem to matter what the issue was. But they had argued with one another and fought with one another for so long that a point came where they agreed to part ways. In the middle of that night, the son found himself unable to sleep, and so he went downstairs to the kitchen to make a sandwich. And who should he find at the kitchen table but his father, who had not been able to sleep either? With the sandwiches made, they sat down and began to visit, to reminisce to talk about all those things they had done in the past when the son was much younger. Little League games, hunting trips, swimming together, going fishing. And as they continued to reminisce, the ice began to thaw. Some healing began its earliest stages of beginning. And the son said, Dad, you remember the time we were out on the lake in that green boat? And his dad said, the boat was blue, son. The son said, no, it was green. The father said, you're mistaken, it was blue. Green, blue. 
green, blue. And his son got up and left, never to return. You and I are part of a family where no two of us are alike. You and I are part of a family that almost has more opinions than we have members. And a fundamental question as we think about treating each other with grace is just how in the world we're supposed to live with all of our differences. Do we have enough wisdom this morning? Do we have enough discernment to recognize, for example, the difference between the truth and our opinions? I recognize there's probably more than one person here today that figures that their opinion equals the truth. I recall my wife's grandfather once saying at the end of every argument, it's okay, you have the right to be wrong. <laughs> but it's also very true, very evident as we listen to one another talk, as we think about the matters that we might agree on and disagree on, that oftentimes we do not know the difference between a point of view and truth. Oftentimes, for example, and I've seen this in Baptist life my entire adult life, we don't seem to be able to distinguish between God and the Bible on one hand and our ideas about God and our interpretations of the Bible. We figure we've interpreted correctly we figure God is exactly like we have envisioned him. And if you happen to have a different interpretation, if you happen to have a different view of God, well, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. Are you able to distinguish the difference? Or are you able to distinguish the difference between things that are truly essential to the Christian faith and things that are of secondary or even tertiary importance are something that really doesn't matter at all. I was telling the early service that I have now been here long enough where I can't remember which stories I have told and which stories I have not. And the only excuse that I can offer is that I'm a grandpa and grandpas are allowed to repeat stories. But it seems like when it comes to the things that we fuss and fume and feud about, the things that we argue about, that our inability to tell what's really important comes into play. I've told some of you the story of the Baptist church out in the country that really couldn't afford to pay a preacher full time. And so they had gone to halftime services. That is, they would meet two weeks out of the month, and the guy who came to preach for them would preach at a different church the other two weeks of the month. And oftentimes, he would come in at the last minute. He'd have just enough time to shuck his coat off, toss it on the back pew, and head up to the front to start the services. And one of the deacons had noticed that oftentimes the preacher's coat was wet or muddy or something else was the matter with it. And so, of course, when he threw it on the back pew, the pew got all wet and dirty. And so he had a brainstorm. He said, why don't, why don't we just hang a peg up there near the back door to give the preacher a place to hang his coat? So he went down there one Saturday with his toolbox and made a nice little wooden peg up there near the door, figured everybody would be content, and he went on home. But then Sunday morning came, and another deacon walked in and saw the peg and was just incensed, irritated, furious that no one had bothered to consult him. And so when the deacon who had made the peg came in, words were exchanged, <laughs> 
And the conversation increased in volume and in intensity and other people got sucked into the conversation. And before you knew it, you had such an argument that the church eventually split. And someone's probably thinking, how, does, how in the world does he know that? Because somewhere in the annals of Baptist churches, and I tend to look for Baptist churches with weird names, you will find that somewhere there existed a church called the Anti-Peg Baptist Church. And you laugh at that. You say it's ridiculous. But what have we fought over? What do we argue about? What's caused people to leave First Church and go elsewhere? What caused you, perhaps, to leave the church you were at and come here? Are you able to tell the difference between truth and an opinion? Are you able to tell the truth, the difference between something essential, something critically important, something fundamental to the faith, and something not? Because that's, in a sense, what is happening there in the Church of Rome. Paul talks in a couple of his letters about people who are weak in faith and those who are strong in faith. And when he refers to those folks who are weak, he's not talking about people that are unclear about the basic Christian faith. He's not talking about people that aren't quite clear if they trust Jesus or not. He's wrestling with those folks who are wondering about a course of action and they're just not quite sure, they're not certain whether or not being a Christian will allow them to do what they're talking about or thinking about doing. And at the same time, there are people in the congregation who hear about what the weak brother is wrestling with, and they're saying, well, of course you can do that. Or perhaps they're saying, no, you should never do that. It's one of those cases where we're dealing with what one of my religion professors called cultural sins. For instance, if you and I were to go over to Europe, and visit with our British Baptist brethren, you would find that as they have fellowship with each other, they're not going to have a bit of, pro of a problem lighting up a cigar or a pipe or a cigarette, but if you'd suggest that you go down to the pub for a pint, they're liable to question your Christianity. But if you go across the channel to Germany to visit with our fellow Baptists, it's exactly the opposite. Let's go down to the beer garden and have a stein, but oh, you smoke? Oh, we're gonna pray the Spirit works in your life because you clearly are not a Christian. But the reality is, when you think about the spectrum between times when a person is weak in faith or strong in faith, you and I are going to be at different points on that spectrum depending on what the issue is. You and I are going to, at times, be very weak and at times be very strong. And the, and the awful thing is, we may not rec recognize just where we are on that spectrum at a given point. That is, there are gonna be times when you are weak in faith, but you think you're strong, and times you're strong when you think you're weak. And the problem with that especially when you consider that the church is supposed to be united, that the church is supposed to be one body, is that you and I will find ourselves confronted by two temptations, and sometimes we give in to one or both of those temptations without a second thought. Paul mentions them both here in those opening verses from Romans 14 when he spoke about those who eat despising the one who abstains and the one who abstains passing judgment on the one who eats. You see, when we disagree with each other, 
When we see a fellow church member, a fellow Christian doing something that we think they shouldn't be doing, or perhaps they're doing something that we wish we might be able to do, there is that temptation to do what Paul calls here to despise that person. The word Paul uses is a word that means to disregard, to disdain, to make light of. It's a mindset, it's an attitude where you're simply not taking the other person seriously. I wonder, has there been a time in a worship service, business meeting, a Sunday school class, some, some other church activity where someone stands up and expresses what they see as the desire of their hearts and people shake their head or roll their eyes and they say, well, you know, that's just Sam being Sam. By the way, if we have a guest here named Sam, I picked that name at random. I didn't have you in mind. useful to ask if there are things that we are taking more seriously than we should and it's useful to ask if there are things we're taking more lightly than we should someone here that you might be despising maybe someone in the early service and you come here because you know they go to the early service and that way you don't have to cross paths with them? Or maybe your temptation is in the other direction. And your temptation is to pass judgment on those who are not quite as Christian, not quite as righteous, not quite as grace-filled, not quite as spirit-filled as you are. The word Paul's using talks about forming an opinion, evaluating, criticizing, finding fault with, condemning. And I've noticed in the times when I've been on the receiving end of that, that those opinions, those criticisms are never expressed in the singular. We have one or two people in the room who have been pastors and I suspect every one of them could testify to those times when someone comes to them and says, Preacher, they're not real happy with what you're doing. Or we're not real happy with what you're doing. And I confess when I've, when I've heard those words in the past, I've probably been more courteous than I wanted to be because I've always wanted to ask, who is the we? Is it you and the mouse in your pocket? How do you deal with folk that you have disagreements with, that you think aren't doing what you believe they ought to be doing? The sad thing is when we tend to judgment when we tend to criticize, when we tend to look down our noses at what that brother or that sister is doing, we usually do that despite the fact that we don't have all the information. We don't know what's happening, or we don't know why it's happening. Or we do it despite not having access to that person's heart or mind. Or better still, we do it not being aware of our own assumptions, our own biases. And oftentimes, to borrow an image from Jesus, we pass judgment not realizing that in that moment we've got a lovely two-by-four plank hanging out of our own eye. 
But someone might say, but, but Steve, we, we need to show people how to, how to live. We need to, to call people on it when they're not living in a Christ-like way. We, we just need to put people in their place. Well, I can understand thinking that way. But the problem is, is that when we look at each other with disdain, when we treat each other as if we do not matter, when we are prone to pass judgment, we're actually doing that to people that God has already accepted. Did you catch that? When Paul tells the Romans, don't let the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Don't let the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. If you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, a believer, one of the things that can be said about you is that God in his sovereign grace and mercy looked at you and basically said, come here. I want to take you along on the greatest adventure you'll ever know. I want you to be part of my family. I want you to be next to me. I want you to be my child. Come on in. You're home. You're welcome. You're accepted. You're forgiven. How in the world did you and I develop enough chutzpah enough hubris to pass judgment on someone God has received. Because those that you and I are tempted to disregard, and, and believe me, I've been in Baptist life long enough that there are people that I confess when we get to glory, I hope my mansion is on the other side of heaven from some of these people. And there are probably people who would look at me and have the same thought. But those that we're tempted to disregard, those we are tempted to criticize, actually belong to God. Paul says to them, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? He says, in essence, that when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to the next pastor who comes your way, that what's really critical is not what I think or what you think or what your neighbor next door thinks. The critical matter is what does God think? Does God welcome them? Does God accept them? He says here, it is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld because the Lord is able to make him stand. Imagine that for a second. Because I bet, if Baptist preachers were allowed to do that, I would be willing to think that there is somebody here who because you've messed up or because somebody has told you you're essentially worthless, that God probably feels the same way about you. And yet... In passages like Romans 8, where you're told nothing in all creation is able to separate us from the love of Christ, God does not look at you and I with disgust when we fall flat on our faces. He doesn't throw up his hands in the air and say, Oh, what am I going to do with you? What the Father has done is to welcome you, to accept you. And the promise is that he will sustain those who belong to him. Which means that you and I don't have to really worry about that. There's a story that occurs near the very end of John's Gospel. Jesus has been raised from the dead. 
He has met with his disciples out at the Sea of Galilee. They've had a lovely fish dinner, and they're walking along the shore, and you have this great conversation between Jesus and Peter, who had denied him, and Jesus is in the process of restoring Peter to the family, if you will. He's told Peter three times, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and feed my sheep. I want you to go and take care of my flock. And in the midst of this conversation, Peter turns around and there's another disciple. The gospel calls him the disciple that Jesus loved. And probably most New Testament scholars would think that that's a reference to John himself. But Peter turns around and sees John and says, well, Lord, what about him? And Jesus says, hey, if I want him to stay around until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. You do what I've told you to do. And there's a very real sense in which those of us who are more prone to disregard or to criticize or to judge need to hear Jesus say to us about the person we're criticizing, the person we're despising, what is that to you? You follow me. Well, if that's the case, if, I don't have, if I'm not supposed to worry about somebody that I hope I'm better than, because I suspect that that's where some of the criticism and complaining and disregarding come, because we have to feel like we're somehow better than, somehow more righteous than, somehow holier than the other party. Well, if that's not what we're supposed to do, if that's not part of our job assignment, if that's way above our pay grade, then where in the world is our focus supposed to be? Look at verses 6 through 8 with me. As he refers to those people who are eating or abstaining, people who celebrate a particular day or don't, he points out how those folks are all doing what they're doing in reference to the Lord. So that he'll say none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That is, whatever we do, whatever we are, in this room, outside this room, in Fredericksburg, wherever we happen to be, whatever we are, whatever we do, is to be done in reference to our Lord. That is, we are to have a Christ-centered mind and a Christ-centered life. Or to put it another way, when we do something, the first question on our mind should not be, oh my goodness, what are the people at church going to think? The first question is, Lord, what would you have me do? What are you, what's your thought in this? Because if you and I choose instead to live on the basis of our own opinions or the opinions of others, or if we choose to live with only our own gratification in mind, then we've lost sight of what really matters. We've lost sight of who we really belong to. And if that's not enough, if it's not sufficient to live with our focus being solely on the Lord, then Paul gives the Romans one other thing to help focus their attention back where it belongs. It's there in verse 10 when he says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And in verse 12, then each of us will give an account of himself to God. My son happened to be home this weekend. And of course, he was asking about y'all and how life was here at the church and, and whether or not I was still enjoying my 
my work among you and with you. And my son, my son can be accused accurately of having something of the same sick sense of humor that I have. And he said, Dad, before you leave, you need to just get up there and give them some old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone. And he says that would... <laughs> and he said that without knowing you. This is as close to hellfire and brimstone as I'm going to give you. You and I have an appointment before the judgment seat of God. Now, the word Paul uses is a word that refers literally to the judges stand at an athletic contest where awards are given, where judgments are made about who won and who did not. But it was something that was set out in the open. The decisions were announced publicly. And so it wasn't a case of judgments taking place behind the scenes. It wasn't a case of the kind of private judging, the kind of private sniping from behind the bushes that often goes on in a church. But there are a couple of things about that that I want you to take to heart. And the first is that we will all be there. There aren't any exemptions. There aren't any passes. Each one of us will have a day before the judgment seat of God. And what Paul tells us there, here's the second thing, is that we will all give an account concerning ourselves. There's nothing there that says, now in the trial, in the hearing of Steve Spivey, we have these witnesses that are going to testify either for or against the person on trial. No. It will simply be you talking about you to God. I'm afraid all too often some of us have the hope that eventually we're going to get up there to glory and we're going to see someone standing before God and we're going to want to go up and say, Lord, 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 please, let let me tell you what this guy's really like. Let me tell you what he did to me. And each one of us probably have stories about how we were hurt or disappointed or disillusioned by a brother or by a sister. But that's not what it's all about. We need to think about when we are going to stand there. And I would suggest that if we take to heart that whatever we are or do is to be centered upon the Lord, if we take to heart the reality that there will be a time of accounting, no matter how unpopular accountability might happen to be nowadays, that perhaps we would be quicker to take to heart what he says down in verse 13, and I'm going to pick up some things from the verses further down, where he says, Since each of us will give an account of himself to God, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. In other words, we need to close our courtrooms 
we need to make the decision that we're not going to play judge, jury, and executioner toward those who are really our brothers and sisters in Christ. That we're not going to put stumbling blocks in one another's path. We're not going to hinder one another from following Christ. But rather, as Paul will put it here, we're going to walk together in love. So that when someone makes a mistake, our response is going to be grace. When we're not real wild about the pace of life together, for some of us it's too slow, for others of us it's too fast, and we get into matters of taste and opinion and style and a host of other things, but regardless, when we aren't seeing things progress the way we want to, our response is grace. When we don't get our way, Gee, that doesn't happen often in church, does it? When we don't get our way, we respond with grace. We make the commitment, as Paul says later in the chapter, that we will not do anything to harm the person for whom Christ died. That we will pursue the things that make for peace that is, those things that will build one another up, those things that will contribute to wholeness, those things that will contribute to the spiritual health of the body. And I'll tell you one other reason. It's not in the text. I'm just throwing this in for free. Another reason why we do this you go back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and you read the opening verses of Matthew 7, one of the things you'll find our Lord saying is that the standard you and I use on each other will be the standard God uses on us. And if I take that seriously, then I'm going to be the most gracious, grace-filled person I can be because I know how desperately how urgently I need grace. So if we would be God's people, if we would be people of grace, then I would ask you this morning to leave the judge's gavel in God's hands and accept one another in the same way God has accepted us. Let's pray. Father, in our broken, fallen state, we would have to admit that there are times we find it fun to shoot our own wounded, where we take a perverse pleasure in pointing out the weaknesses and flaws and mistakes of others. Forgive us. Forgive us when we don't take one another seriously. Forgive us when we're tempted to disregard one another. Forgive us when we're so quick to pass judgment. Forgive us for withholding grace when grace has been so urgently needed. Lord, you sent your Son to die for us. which says something about your love for us and your desire for us to be part of your family. Your word tells us that you have accepted us because of Christ. That the only one who might accuse or condemn us is the very one who died to save us. Help that to transform our thinking. Oh God, 
There is so much your spirit could do in this place. So much your spirit could do in us and through us. If we would take to heart what Paul has written here. If we would allow you to bind us together in love and mercy and grace. If we were to treat one another as people for whom Christ died. Lord, have mercy. Help us to let go of the gavel in our hands. I ask this for Christ's sake and in his name. Amen. Let's stand. You know that the invitation time is usually a time for folks to come and publicly profess faith in Christ. It's a time for Christians to come and recommit themselves to following Christ. It's a time where people come and say, hey, this is where Christ wants me to serve him and I want to join the church here. And all of those are good and proper things to take place in the next couple of minutes. But there's something else I would challenge you with. Whether it's in the next couple of minutes or this afternoon, to go to one you have judged, one you have despised, one you have treated as if they do not matter, and say to them, forgive me. Do you have enough grace to do that? Do you have enough grace to hear that if someone comes to you? What would God have you do? That's the question you need to ask as we sing. Just as I